started. We're going to be working our way through Isaiah chapter 33, verses 17 through 22. Isaiah chapter 33. Verses 17 through 22. You guys notice that Jacob is not here tonight. His father isn't doing well. So if y'all could be in prayer for, for Jacob's dad, we would greatly appreciate it. Again, Isaiah chapter 32, verses 17 through 22. Your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. They will see a land that stretches afar. Your heart will muse on the terror. Where he is who count, where is he who counted? Where is he? Who weighed the tribute? Where is he who counted the towers? You will see no more the insolent people, the people of an obscure speech that you cannot comprehend, stammering in a tongue that you cannot understand. Behold, Zion, the city of our appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem, an untroubled habitation, an an immovable tent, whose stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there the Lord in majesty will be for us a place of broad rivers and streams where no galley with oars can go, nor majestic ship can pass. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Now before we can dig into those verses, we must do what we always do, back up, discuss what we talked about last week so that we keep everything in its proper context. Now last week we made our way through Isaiah chapter 33 verses 13 through 16. And surprise, surprise, Isaiah is prophesying to the southern kingdom. But not only is he speaking to the southern kingdom this time around, this message is also going to bring up the Gentiles. And they're going to hear about how this powerful Assyrian army that that has been wreaking terror all throughout the world, is going to fall. They're going to see this powerful army, that that, that this region in which they were dominating, the, the people were just terrified of. But the world is going to hear about God crushing this mighty empire. This wicked, mighty empire that God himself brought up to strike fear into the hearts of the Gentiles, to strike fear into the hearts of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And why is that? Because both the northern and southern kingdom have turned from God. And if you recall, the the prophet Isaiah even told the southern kingdom about the Assyrian army that's going to be brought up. And then what does he tell the southern kingdom specifically? He tells them to place your faith in God. God will be your protector. You do not need to worry about this empire that is going to be dominating this region. That, that That fear should not be in you. We even know the prophet Isaiah tells the southern kingdom, listen, your government officials aren't going to place their faith in God. Instead, what they're going to do, they're going to go to Egypt. They're going to place their faith in this pagan land for protection. He even names the region and he tells them, do not go there. But we know exactly what the southern kingdom does. They reject God, they reject the prophet Isaiah, and they go to Egypt for protection. But we know that's not going to work. For Egypt cannot stand against the mighty empire, that being the Assyrians, that God has brought up to bring his wrath upon his very people. So the government officials of the southern kingdom, they know all of this. They've listened to the prophet Isaiah. But they do not hear him. They they do not respond to him. Because what do the government officials do? The government officials make a deal with the Assyrians. And they tell the Assyrians, listen, uh, we're going to pay you guys. Uh, If we pay you guys, then y'all won't attack us, right? Is that a good deal? We we pay y'all. Y'all don't attack, attack us. Now just think about the pride of man. With these government officials of the southern kingdom. 
They have the inspired prophet telling them what to do, but they believe that they know better. That they believe that they don't need God for protection. They can do it themselves. So they come up with this plan. They pay the Assyrians not to attack them. But what do the Assyrians do? Do they care about that deal that's been made? Absolutely not. They're going to take the money and still attack the southern kingdom. And this strikes fear into their hearts. But this is what is so mind-boggling, and maybe it shouldn't be because we, we, we're doing this today. We, we have the Word of God, and yet we believe that we know better. That's exactly what the southern kingdom did. But when they find out that the Assyrians are, not, are now going back on their word and are coming for them, they, they're, they're terrified. And yet the whole time the promise has been given to them, if they just place their faith in him and him alone, they won't need to worry about any foreign armies coming after them. But that's not what they did. So God, God keeping his promise, God keeping his covenant is going to crush the Assyrians. Not because of anything that the southern kingdom has done. It's because of the promise that he has made that there is going to be a remnant coming from them. And that remnant through that bloodline is going to bring the Messiah. When God crushes the Assyrians, we hear that the northern and the southern kingdom, that they tremble in fear. But it's not just the northern and southern kingdom, it's also the Gentiles that tremble in fear of God. Why? Because no one could stop the Assyrians. There, there was no man-made army that could stand against them. Everyone that tried, they were just devoured. They were pushed over. They were taken in as slaves. Their land was stripped from them. But, but then they see the mighty work of God, where God alone kills 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. He sends the angel of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord decimates them. And of course, the northern and the southern kingdoms are going to hear about this. The world is going to hear about this. And finally, you see that fear of the Lord start to consume them. And what does that mean? When one finally starts to fear the Lord, that is the knowledge of God. And where does that fear come from? Look at what Isaiah said last week. Who among us can dwell with consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Now you think about the Assyrian army that, that was just crushed by God, and, and this is what they are now experiencing, this, this everlasting burning, this consuming fire. God's eternal damnation being poured out upon them. Why? Because of their unbelief. The, the very unbelief that the northern and the southern kingdom, God's own people, were struggling with. But then they see this happen, and you see this fear strike them. So what is the answer to this question? Who can dwell with everlasting burnings? Who among us can dwell with consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Who can do it? Only the ones whose faith is placed in God, that is it. That they are the only ones that will not face God's eternal damnation. They are the only ones who will not face God's wrath being poured out upon them for their sins that they have committed against the holy of holies. But something else happens with, with, with that fear that first strikes them, and now they have this knowledge of God. 
We know that not only is their heart being regenerated, but because of their heart being regenerated, because of their faith in God, do you know what their life looks like now? It's a life that's dedicated to the Lord. So not only has their thought changed, not only has their heart changed, but their actions have changed. This is the fruit of a true believer. No longer living like they once did. So what does this mean for the southern kingdom? The very southern kingdom who started worshiping false gods. The the very southern kingdom who was looking to their government officials for answers, for safety, for security, for salvation in some sense. But all of that changes when one comes to the faith because now they look to God and His Word for their protection, for their salvation. All right, let's dive in. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 33. Let's look at verse 17. It says here, Your eyes will behold the king in his beauty. They will see a land that stretches afar. Now there are some theologians who have tried to make this verse about a human historical king. But but there's an issue with that, isn't there? The the issue is this, that all throughout the book of Isaiah, at least so far, and what we have seen, these 33 chapters that have only taken us three and a half years to get through them, but all throughout the book of Isaiah, what is he doing? He's warning the northern and the southern kingdom to what? To not place their faith in man. That, That was one of the major issues for God's people. Their faith wasn't in God, it was in man, it was in the government. For they, the Israelites, had turned from God. They believed that they could trust in their own human kings, in foreign armies, in pagan rulers. But this right here isn't pointing to a human, earthly king. This is pointing to the Messiah. In the same way in which Psalm 45 points us to the promised king. I'm not going to go to Psalm 45, but I would say read it. Hopefully tonight when you get home, it's beautiful. But it's pointing us to the Messiah, the perfect holy king who is coming. But then Isaiah also says this. He says that they will see a land that stretches afar. For the land of Canaan, it was limited. It it has borders. But Christ, the King of kings, the Savior, will have no boundaries. For the gospel will reach all throughout the world, rescuing every single one of His elect. Now look at verse 18. It says, your heart will muse on the terror. Now remember, this is a prophetic word. It's about a future event that is going to take place. So now we're going to fast forward, even though this is a prophetic word, because now Isaiah is talking about when the Judeans, the remnant, are going to be able to look back on this time. When this took place, the the Assyrians were pressing down upon them. Their, Their lives seemed hopeless. That they, they felt helpless because they were relying on man and not God. And it just seemed dark. They're looking to one another, that being the southern and the, the southern kingdom. And they're saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to protect ourselves? I mean, we've already tried paying Egypt. That's not working. And now we're, we're going to pay the Assyrians. But now we find out that they're not going to hold their end of the deal. And they're coming after us. When the answer has been there the entire time, it was their faith in God. Where was it? You talk about this region, this part of this nation that was godly at one point in time. They recognized who God was and is. He was the very one who rescued them. He was the very one who gave them the laws, the commandments, the prophets. And and they appreciated that. They worshipped Him because of that. They understood that He was the only Savior. 
But now their land was falling apart. They were embracing sin as if there was no tomorrow. So of course everything is going to look dark. Of course they are going to feel helpless because their faith wasn't in God. But there's going to be a time when this remnant, the Judeans, are going to be able to look back when it was so dark and bleak. But once God revealed himself, crushed the Assyrians, brought fear into their heart. That they're going to understand that they weren't helpless. That they weren't hopeless. They were just without the one who they were going to place all their faith in. He was there, but they were rejecting him. So yes, they're going to be able to look back. Your heart will muse on the terror but now, now they no longer have that fear. They're no longer worrying about this foreign empire coming for them because God's justice had eliminated that threat. And you think about it. Did they do anything for God's justice? For his protection? No, absolutely they didn't. Not a single thing they had turned from God. And yet, because of the promise that he had made to them, he was going to stand by his promise. And then listen, listen, because this speaks to us still today, okay? You, you think about this time that we are living in right now. We, we have a government that is split you got one side who's wanting to kill babies, and you have the other side who hopefully is still trying to protect those babies. And that's what our nation is fighting over right now. That, that's the big deal right now. Whether or not a baby has the opportunity to be born. And listen, it doesn't get any more wicked than that. But we were also a nation that it was just sexually perverted. And what do we see? What do we expect with this? Of course, God's judgment. But for those of us whose faith is in Christ and in Him alone, we are protected. We will not face the wrath of God. Do we deserve his protection? No. We don't, but that's what he has given us by way of his grace and mercy. Through his promise, he has rescued us from the wrath that is coming. So, so here, Isaiah is speaking about a future event. The Judeans looking back on this time thinking, man, it was extremely dark, but God rescued us from that. Isaiah then asked the question, where is he who counted? Where is he who weighed the tribute? Where is he who counted the towers? Now this is speaking of the Assyrians. Once again, the southern, the southern kingdom, their government was paying the Assyrians not to attack them. So what, of course, would the Assyrians be doing? Every time that payment came up, they would be counting it, making sure it's all there. Were they going to stick to their end of the agreement? Of course not. Their plans were to attack the Assyrians, but they're going to count their money every time they gave it to them. And then you had the Assyrian scouts who would make their way in to the southern kingdom and count the towers. Why would they be counting the towers? Those were the watchtowers. This was part of their plan on how they were going to attack them. So what is Isaiah asking them now? Where are these very ones who were coming after you? Where are they now, O oh, southern kingdom? God had crushed them. They're nowhere to be found, eliminated. Why? Because that's what God had promised his people. Look at verse 19. 
It says, you will see no more the insolent people, the people of an obscure speech that you cannot comprehend, stammering in a tongue that you cannot understand. It's the Syrian people. No longer did they have this burden upon them wondering when they were going to strike. No longer did they fear this mighty empire. For God had crushed the wicked. Now, I think sometimes we we don't actually comprehend the weight of this. When we talk about the Assyrians being this mighty empire with this powerful army that no one could stop, I mean, no one could stop them. God had given them that ability to be that strong, to be that powerful, to strike that fear into every single nation's heart. But just for a moment, just if you can, kind of put yourself in this scenario, worrying about this foreign invader coming after you. That's going to rip you out of your home. If you're a guy, more than likely they're going to kill you right then and there. The women will be taken in as slaves. This is the fear that you would be living with. You can only imagine what they would do to your children. And you hear about this mighty empire and it keeps growing and growing. And then you hear about this mighty empire setting up camp outside of Jerusalem. And you know what's going to happen next. You don't have the army to stand against them. The very people that you were hoping would have your back have bailed because they're terrified of them as well. And then in one night, you wake up the next morning and you're wondering when this attack's going to occur and you get word that there's not going to be an attack because they're gone. Oh, they're gone? Uh, They left? They they went back? No, no, no. When I say they're gone, they've been annihilated. 185,000 soldiers are now dead. They're just bleeding out on the hill. But wait, what army? Who, Who protected us? Who came against them? And then you get word, the angel of the Lord... Wait, wait, I I know that God has an army of angels, but but did I hear you correctly? One, the angel of the Lord just wiped out 185,000 powerful soldiers that people are terrified of. Yes. Could you imagine counting the bodies? That That would have been a lot. But anyway, the angel of the Lord... They're gone. Now look at verse 20. It says, Behold, Zion, the city of our appointed feast, your eyes will see Jerusalem. For the remnant whose faith is now looking or is back in God, they're no longer looking to their borders for the Assyrians to attack them. They're no longer worrying about that. Instead, what is it saying? They will be able to celebrate the Lord. You'll be able to once again look to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? You know, that's where the Ark of the Covenant was located, the city where the pilgrimages were going to be made to serve the Lord. That is going to be their primary focus once again. And they, they, they understand it now. They're, they're secure because of him. Not because of anyone else, but because of him. Their faith isn't going to be in the government. Their faith isn't going to be in the corrupt religious leaders who perverted the temple of God. No, they know that they are secure because of God. Because it was him once again who rescued his people. In the southern kingdom, this remnant 
All glory and the credit is going to go to the King of Kings who brought His people back to Himself. Now look what it says. It says, an untroubled habitation, an immovable tent whose stakes will never be plucked up, nor will any of its cords be broken. So we're given this illustration of the tent. And what's a tent for? It's for a traveler who is constantly on the move. So what is this illustration? It's for the Judeans for, for the longest time who were wanderers because they were placing their faith in the government and their corrupt religious leaders or in false gods. But now they can finally stop that roaming, that wandering, that looking for salvation because they know where it lies in God and in Him alone. No longer are they looking to foreign armies paying them for protection or making deals with the very ones who are coming after you. No, they don't have to. They don't want to now because they're listening to the prophet. They're listening to the words and the commands of the Almighty One. For it's when one's faith is placed in God, for it's then and then alone that one can finally rest in Him and Him alone. Verse 21 says, But there the Lord and majesty will be for us, a place of broad rivers and streams. They're going to realize that God is and always will be the mighty protector for his children. Now, if you were to look at the landscape of Jerusalem, during that time, there are no mighty rivers or streams to protect them from foreign invaders. Now you look at Nineveh and Babylon, these, these mighty, empire, mighty empires with powerful armies. They had streams for protection surrounding them, but not Jerusalem. Jerusalem didn't need it because they had God, and when their faith was placed in Him, He was their stream. He was their protector. He was their mighty wall. And it's going to be during this time that God's people are going to come to this realization that God is their protector. It's far greater than any river or stream. He continues with this illustration where he says, where no galley with oars can go, nor majestic ship can pass. So it's not only that these streams provide protection, but they also provided an excellent highway, which the Babylonians and the Ninevites would use for their naval attack on foreign armies. But Jerusalem didn't need that. For God was far superior than any ship. Let's close in verse 22. And this is really straightforward. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. Here Isaiah is prophesying this good news that, that they are going to return back to the one who is the judge, who is the lawgiver, who is the king, the only one who can save. For God is the judge of his people. And he will be their defender. God is their lawgiver. For he is the one who gives the people the proper interpretation and application of his laws. For he is the one who makes the laws. And he is the king. The very one who will enforce those laws. Now listen, because th this is true back then as it is today. This doesn't exclude the government during their time or ours because God puts those men in place to rule. But it shows us how our government is to run 
if they are a government that has submitted to the laws and will of God. But sadly, it also shows us, shows us if we are under judgment, when the government who rules over us no longer submits to the laws of God. And listen, that, that, that's where we are today. And I, I don't mean for this to be bad news, because, because it isn't for the believer. But for our nation as a whole, we are under God's judgment. You, you look at the laws that are being passed. That's not, it doesn't line up to the laws and commands in which God has given us. Nowhere even close. So we, we are underneath a godless leadership. That's the judgment that's been given to us. But you know what that means? As it gets darker and darker in this nation, the church is going to shine brighter and brighter. And this is wonderful. This is a beautiful time to be a believer. It may be a little bit scary, but that's okay. Because we know as his people that he is our judge. He is our lawgiver. He is our king. And he will save us. So we are to proclaim the word during this dark time. Questions? Comments? Comments?